morning here in Fort Smith, both those of you at home, and the ever-increasing number of you that are here in person. It's really nice to see a lot of folks I haven't seen in a while, uh, the last few weeks, especially today, several people have showed up that uh, we haven't seen in a while, so that's great to see you. Um, a lot of great news um, with the, uh, the health front, vaccines are getting out there, we're starting to feel a little bit more comfortable about returning a little bit more to normal. Um, my, uh, my daughter Heather and her family came, got to see my grandsons this week, and they met uh, my parents, got to know my parents for the first time in over a year uh, this week, so that was fantastic, and I know we're all looking forward to, to getting back to normal. Uh, more things are happening a little bit more normal here at church. We have uh, um, Sunday schools getting started back for the adults the last few weeks. Uh, uh, Danny's been leading some great sessions with us. Nick's going to have another session for us next week. He may tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit, but it's gonna, we're going to look forward to that. And the week after that, we're going to split back into our normal uh, two adult Sunday school classes going uh, pretty regularly after that meeting here in person. So that's going to be a great uh, elders meeting uh, after church today. So there are lots of lots of good things happening. But uh, we can't let up yet on our COVID precautions. Remember to keep wearing your masks, stay socially distant. Uh, we're still still only about 25% of the adults in, in Arkansas have been vaccinated. So uh, you know, we're still we're still in the process of, of getting there. We're getting closer and closer, but we can't let up yet. Uh, remember to fill out the, the attendance cards in your, in your pew. We use, hopefully we won't need those for contact tracing, but if we do, we'll have that information. Just a record of you being here. Uh, remember that the, we're still doing the, uh, in the Narthex, of course we have the hand sanitizer and stuff out there. We also have the uh, uh, offering plates are out there. Hopefully you, uh, put your offering in when you came in this morning, or if not, you can get that on the way out. Um, we're thankful for all those who've, who've kept up their tithes and offerings uh, during this time. And uh, let's see what else we got. Um, of course, we always uh, we're always uh, have uh, joys and concerns, and uh, we still have. You know, we're getting more and more of us coming coming in here. We know that there are those who. We will not be able to be here with us in person, and we we really uh, want to know that you're with, with you in spirit at, at home as well. We want to keep those folks in our prayers. Um, we want to lift up uh, some folks that are they're recovering, and just still recovering from her uh, fairly recent surgery. Um, Leslie has had some surgery; is going to be starting some chemotherapy this week. So please lift her up in, her, in our prayers. I know she'd appreciate that. Um, so, uh, are there any, any other announcements or joys or concerns that we need to bring forward at this time that I'm not aware of? Okay. Well, without further ado, let's, let's start to prepare our minds and our hearts for continued worship as we continue in prayer. Sunday school before we get into it. Uh, you may notice we're working on a central hub out here in the Narthex, and what that is, that's just so that folks, whenever they come by, they instantly get the information they need, all in one place. But who the church is, what we're about, some of the things that make us similar to others, some that make us a little bit unique, uh, and also ways to grow in your faith. And one of them that I've known is uh, a helpful guide to the Bible. I noticed a lot of folks, they know a bunch of Bible stories, but they, they aren't quite sure how it all fits together. So what this is going to be next week in Sunday School is we're just going to walk through what is the basic story of the Bible, uh, what makes the Bible special. And more can be found on here. I'm not going to go through every detail. If you want to figure out what's going on in, say, Obadiah, run, run. But we are going to have a good overview, so I hope you can join for that. Now, Jack already asked if there's any announcements, but he got no responses, and I don't, I don't quite believe that. We got to get good at this. Come on, y'all. Give me a couple of good announcements, joys, concerns. What are we seeing? God is not dead. One more time. God is not dead. Amen. Oh yeah, there we go. It's that easy. 
too, y'all. Come on. Two more of those. Two more of those. Somebody. We got the sun shining. We got good marriages, good families. We got all sorts of good news. You got nothing? My cat's sick, and I wish for all the things of good thoughts for my cat. We'll work with that. We'll work with that. Okay. We got, we got a sick cat. We'll be. We'll be in prayer. I'll be in prayer. <laughs> one more. I believe in one more. We got it. Margo. Uh, yes, thank you for everybody that has come to you while they're uh, he wanted to come this morning, but I won't let him ride yet. But we'll be back this week. Yeah, yeah John's recovering. He's been in good spirits and he's had a really good um, not by, by her will, but a good caretaker nonetheless. <laughs> All right. We'll cut that out. I'll get into it. Uh, let's go to God with our call of worship. All right. Today's call of worship comes to us from Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His compassion is over all that he has made. The Lord is faithful in all his works and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Gather us to worship you, Lord, as you have chosen to showcase your great love and called us to be bearers of the light of your work. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Now, would you stand and join me in, in the uh, morning prayer? God, we come to you this morning from different blocks of life, from different areas, from different situations, but we are not divided. We come together as one people this morning, for we are united in Christ. And universally, we pray for His will to be done. So we pray that you would strengthen us in unity as your people. For we share one faith, we have one calling. We are of one soul and one mind. We have one God and Father. We are filled with one spirit. We are baptized with one baptism. We eat of one bread. We drink of one cup. We confess one name. We are obedient to one Lord. We work for one cause. We share one hope. God, together we come to know the height and the breadth and the depth of your love for us in Jesus Christ. Together we, we seek to be built up to the stature of Christ, to the new humanity. Together we know and bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfilling the law of Christ. That we do need one another. That we are called to build up one another. That we are people who seek to love others, not as the world loves, but as Christ loves. Admonishing and comforting one another. Grieving and suffering together, never leaving anyone to their own devices, but always being one people, your body. God, we pray for all of these things, and we, we especially have been suffering and admonishing and comforting one another this past 13 months or so, with this virus, with George Floyd and the protests and the demonstrations that have followed. There has been so much that has been difficult, and yet you have continued to pour in life and light and good news. We thank you that this past week, for George Floyd, as a child made in the image of God, and as a symbol for an ongoing hope to be that more perfect union, that you have delivered justice in this trial, and that you, you are showcasing that we can yet be better, that we can yet open our hearts, that we can yet form something beyond where we are today. We thank you for that, and we know that it is not done, that there is still far too much wickedness that goes on in this world, but that you remain our Lord, that you remain the one with a plan, the one who breathes new life and takes us forward every day. So we do give you thanks. 
even in the midst of hard times and strange times and everything else. We pray all this as one people, in the name of Jesus Christ, as he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. breath and 
and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we all can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. This is the word of the Lord.
questions. And this week's actually a simple, a simple scripture. I wasn't joking when I said this was a dense book, but we were only going to get the thousand mile overview that preachers have spent at least six months on each of the verses we've seen before, and that we were trying to cram all that into about a 15 minute sermon. But this week, this is actually manageable. We can do this. So let's recap the big ideas we've seen so far in Ephesians, and then let's, let's just jump right in, because Paul, he offers us this beautiful prayer this morning. And I just want to walk through it with us. What we saw in the first week, we saw Paul, he makes the case that God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And you see God in the whole and the creation of the world. I have no say in that. None of us have a say in how the world was created. That it was out of our hands, that it was in God's hands. But we see at the end, Better or worse, we don't have a say in that either. That's something that we don't have control of. We see instead God fully controls the beginning and the end. But we're somewhere here in the middle. And so Paul, in that first sermon, what we saw him doing was we saw his argument that in the middle it's, it's weird and it's messy and it's full of political nonsense and pain and suffering and just all sorts of misery. But it's also punctuated in the center point to the fullness of time by Jesus Christ, that God had sent His Son to show us His ways, that we may follow Him. That that is our greatest calling, that we can look to Jesus, we can follow who He is, how He lived, and we can take that on and live that ourselves. And we showcase Jesus Christ, the way of God, to so many people. That people would come to know who God is, what God's about, what God does in people's lives, through us modeling Jesus Christ. And God, He specifically chose that, that way of moving from point A to point B because He is not interested in His plan being moving us around like chess pieces. It's much more beautiful than that. So instead, and this was last week, we saw that God's means to get us through the plan is not some chess piece deterministic game. Instead, He breathes new life, salvation, aliveness, wholeness, all of these great things. The Hebrews call it has said. All these things into us that we would be enabled to follow Jesus in bigger ways. That we would have a beautiful, active part in God's story. Not just watch as God takes it, but instead get to be included. Frankly, the gospel is not about us, it's about Jesus. And we're included. God has chosen to use us in his story. And so that's what we've seen in the past couple of weeks. We've seen God's story moving us from point A, from the beginning of the world, to a good end, a good ending. Exactly what we want to see even better. And the way we do that is by following Jesus Christ, His ways. And the way we follow Jesus Christ in His ways is by having a new life breathed into us, an aliveness deep within us that comes by grace, not by our works, not by us trying to force our will, not by us doing a noble action or having it all figured out by seeking out some some perfect doctrine in Christianity or some esoteric books buried deep in a library, but simply by taking breath, letting God be God, accepting that, letting Him breathe new life into us as we follow Jesus Christ. So those are the pieces so far. Like I said, that's that's quite a handful, isn't it? Y'all have known, you've been there the past couple of weeks, it's quite a handful. But this week, we're jumping forward into chapter 3, and Paul, he takes these building blocks, and he just, he does something beautiful with it. And I just want to pause and, and walk us through these verses, because it really gets into the, the pastoral side of Paul. See, Paul, he's, frankly, he's not convinced that the Christian is done. He's not convinced that the church has nothing left to say. He is not convinced that Jesus Christ is done in the world. So what he's doing, while he's imprisoned in Rome, as he's writing this letter, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, and he is pleading with them, he is praying for them. He records a copy of his prayer, what he's praying, so that they would know. And all it is, frankly, is he is praying that we would be spurred on to pray. He is growing from him, the richness in his spiritual life, and hoping that we would experience that too. So like I said, if you did the hard work to get here, let's enjoy it this morning. We're going to walk through this sort of verse by verse and just take it in and bask in it. 
This is Paul and he writes from a Roman prison and he writes to us about how great our God is. One thing before we get into it, I do want us to notice an overarching theme. This will be one of our big takeaways that we'll get to after we go through the scriptures. I want us to notice specifically the way God works. We touched on this a little bit last week. But this is a profound truth of Christianity that Paul, he is not, even while in prison by the Romans, he is not complaining about the government. He is not arguing about leaders here or there. Don't vote for these guys, vote for those guys. He's not doing any of that. Not because Christians can't have opinions, but because he trusts in a better way. He trusts that the way God works is not top down of the highest level authorities trickling down to us, but instead God's work is deep, deep down at the bottom. But God does something new and it flows up. He's going to record this prayer and every single point he's going to come back to is God wants to fill you with this aliveness, this salvation, this fullness deep within you that it would have effects as it flows out of you. God does not want to give you a perfect, easy life. God does not, no matter what the TV preachers say, want you to be, you know, a millionaire with a private jet and all. That's not God's problem. God's MO is instead to fill you with an aliveness deep within you that would then flow out from you. And that's much more beautiful, much greater, and much more true. So Paul, he's going to be going back to that again and again. Not talking about lofty goals and changing empires, but instead something much more simple yet profound. A new life deep within you that then will cause new life to flow out of you. All right. So let's get into it. This is a good one if you want to open to the back of your bulletins and, and be watching it. We're going to be taking this verse by verse for a moment. We're starting in verse 14 and Paul, he just lays it out for us. He says, this is the reason that I believe in God the Father. He is gearing up on us. If we were to back up a little bit, we'd see that just a few verses ago, Paul writes about how it's clear. It's clear that there's mysteries in the world. It's clear that none of us can make these big emphatic claims about, well, I've figured out every mystery of who God is. None of us can say that. He knows he started this letter, by the way, by talking about a sovereign God who's overviewing all of creation from beginning to end. He knows that's the whole claim. And so this right here, he's saying, but here's why I believe it. In verse 15, if we were to continue, he, he goes further just to clarify what he's about to tell us about. He says, this is the God who every family on earth and in heaven gets its name. Just in the same way that when you have a child, you give them your last name. You pass it down because you made them. This is the God that everyone and everything gets its name from. That we all share this one God as our Father. Everything we ever touch, everyone we ever know, every race, every creed, every nationality, every beautiful thing in life that we will ever see was created by this God. Not just everything you see, everything you know, everything you feel, all the invisible attributes in life, the joys, the loves, all the spiritual happenings way beyond us, all of that, all of that, that's sourced from God. God created that. So he's saying, let me tell you why I believe in this God. And so what we get into is, as he just starts laying that out. Oh, I'm getting excited, y'all. You gotta excuse me, I'm geeking on this one. Paul, he is about to tell us why he believes in God. You know, Paul, the mastermind, the guy who wrote about half the New Testament and made these mind-boggling massive books like Ephesians, like Romans, 1 Corinthians. He's about to, in about four verses, tell us why he believes in God. Now, let me tell you what he's not going to do. He's not going to give us a mathematical or scientific proof of God. But he's not going to try to go lynch pin an answer and say, gotcha, now we're stuck with God. There's no other way. That's not his game plan, all right? See, the, the simple fact is that life is so much bigger. And life is so much better than what you can logically prove. In fact, jump ahead with me. Jump ahead for just a second. We'll get back on it. But jump ahead to verse 19 with me. 
Paul says there is a love, a grace, a source of life that far surpasses knowledge. How much can you really know? How much can you put on a chalkboard or logically prove? You can't prove that hiking is a beautiful experience. You can't prove on a chalkboard that cherry pie tastes good. So much of what's good and true and beautiful in the world, you cannot line out mathematically or scientifically. And God is the same way. As we look to Paul's prayer, we're going to notice these petitions that he makes, these hopes from his prayer that he makes. They have immense value to us, and yet none of them try to mathematically or scientifically prove God. He's not interested in making an airtight logical proof, even to this day. By the way, any of the books that, that try to make an airtight case for God, they're falling short. Right? Either, first of all, most of them are just rife with errors. They jump to really convenient conclusions really early on. But second of all, it's just a, a shallow, trite faith that just wants to prove God and never experience God. To what he's getting into in, in verse 19, asking us to, to really know God with a love that surpasses knowledge. He's, he's talking about having a relationship with God where, where we know God in the, the biblical sense. Um, let's be adults about this, but y'all know sometimes in the Bible when it says somebody knew somebody, it's not talking about having a mental relationship. Talk about intimacy. Ruth knew Boaz. David knew Bathsheba. This is the same idea. It's a metaphor. You know, be adults, but he is not tasking us with filling our heads with knowledge, but getting into an intimate relationship with our God. So with that, with that being the task at hand, let's return to where we left off, back at verse 16. Paul, oh, he gives us three petitions this morning in his prayer. The first is he's praying that we would know God like he knows God. He prays that, in verse 16, that we would know the riches of God. Everything that's in that far-off reality, heaven, that it would be somehow within us, all of God's grace, all of God's glory, brimming with light, joy, peace, all those good things, that they would somehow find themselves deeply lodged in our souls. Praying, frankly, that that aliveness, that grace, that salvation, the very power of the resurrection, what happened to Jesus on Easter morning, would be found within us. And he's praying that specifically as we connect dots. If we look to verse 17, he's praying that we would have this aliveness in us, that it would empower us in our hearts, to hold up Jesus Christ. Paul, he wants us to be active witnesses to Jesus Christ. And so he's getting to the root of the problem. Again, remember, he's always going to go bottom up, not top down. He understands how God works. God works by scooping up the bottom and bringing it up, not just cutting off from the top. And so he's asking us from the very depth of your soul, find this aliveness, because if you find this aliveness, this salvation, you will naturally be a disciple to Jesus Christ. If you are a disciple to Jesus Christ, if you figure out that there is truth in Him, you figure out that His ways are the ways, you figure out that Jesus Christ, the way He acted every single day, is the exact way that I know I want to grow into, you figure out the way you wish the whole world worked, how people could work with people, that all of that is how Jesus Treat everybody every day. If you find out that Jesus, He is the way of God, He is the truth of God, if you figure that out and you have an aliveness brimming within you, it's going to work itself out naturally. You see? And so He asks that we would have something in the depth of our souls, an aliveness, a salvation deep within us, because it would naturally bubble up, cause us to want to follow Jesus in bigger, bolder ways. That through us, more people would encounter Jesus Christ. That through us, God's kingdom on earth would come a little bit further today. That's incredible. That's us getting to be a part of God's story. That was God looking down from beyond comprehension, from beyond anything we can understand, and saying, Janet, 
She will be a part of my story. Darlene will be a part of my story. Isn't that incredible? And so that's the first petition. Paul asks that there would be this aliveness within us, that we would find it, that we would grow in it, because that would naturally lead us the truth of Jesus Christ. And if we find the truth of Jesus Christ, who he was, and we hold on to that more than anything else, more than money or politics or fame or fortune or respect or any of that stuff, and instead say, Jesus and his ways, selfless love for all our neighbors, justice for all people, mercy for all of God's children, we held those up as the true ways of God, we'll make it to the kingdom. So that's the first petition, and it's, it's striking. It's beautiful. It shows us the work of God, this work that goes from the bottom up, starts deep in hearts and souls. Once that's fixed, once those are brimming with life from this gift we have from God, will naturally flow out into better lives, better actions, better worlds. And so he continues on. He, he's talking about this cause and effect process of what we're rooted in, what we're getting deep from our souls and flowing out. And he, he gives us a second petition that frankly sounds a lot like the first. All of these kind of flow together, but let's walk through it because Again, it's beautiful, and I love it. And y'all are stuck with me. In verse 17, Paul, he, he continues on. He's giving us his second petition, and he prays, prays that this new life in us, salvation, wholeness, aliveness, all these good things, that trickles up into our hearts, that causes our hearts to naturally want to follow Jesus Christ. He's praying a similar thing to that. He prays just simply, I want that to happen so that you would be rooted in love. That we would, we would know, not in a provable way, but in a way that surpasses knowledge, that we are loved, that we are loved by God, that we are created to be loved, to love others, to spread this love from God to the Christian to the ends of the earth until kingdom come. That's his prayer. That's the whole same petition. But looking at it doctrinally, I, I gotta be frank, I love to look at doctrine, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't capture the fullness of, of verse 17 because Paul, he's being ambiguous here. Notice that he just sort of says, be rooted and grounded in love. And then he moves right on. And so we really have to tackle this from another greater way. Now, frankly, if you know your New Testament, Paul is rarely ambiguous. Uh, Paul rarely has an issue telling us what he thinks. But here he says this, this sort of poetic second petition, be rooted in love. Be rooted in love. And so, looking at it, you know, as far as I can tell, that just means exactly what it sounds like. That this second petition of Paul's prayer, just like the first, but it's a poetic image. He wants us to live almost like a mighty tree. It wins, they'll kick up from time to time, and we'll get swayed, but we don't get blown over. Because we're rooted in love, we have deep roots. Life happens, it might bend us, it might shake us, but we're going to return to where we've been rooted. We're not going to weather or die, not really. We've tapped into to something life-giving, something that breathes new life into us constantly. Now, there will be seasons of life where we feel dried out and like life hasn't flown through us, but we're rooted in something good. We're rooted in the love of God. It keeps on supplying what we need. Finally, that, that the fruit of our lives, everything we produce at home, at work, in our free time, wherever we are, whatever we put out into the world, what that would be would be a product of what we're rooted in. You know, everything that comes up through the tree, it's just a matter of what it's rooted in comes up through the tree and it produces these great fruit based on what it's rooted in. So Paul, he asks, be rooted in love for yourself that you may know it so you wouldn't be thrown to and fro in the mighty tree so that you would not really die. It would be a change but you would not really die. And finally, so that everything you put out into the world would be a product of what you're rooted in. You can be rooted in a lot of things. You know the saying, garbage in, garbage out? Imagine if it was God's overwhelming love in. If you grew 
close from that, what would come out of you? And so that's, that's the extent of Paul's second petition, just be rooted in love. There's so many things you can root your life in, but be rooted in love, there's none better. Now, just like the, the first and the second petition flow together, so does the third. In verse 18, he, he says this, this third aspect to his prayer. And all he's doing, again, we're, we've gone to a simple part of it. He just asks us to comprehend the scope of this love. The love of God, to, to get an idea of what that looks like. And he gives us a couple of dimensions. He says, know its breadth, know its length. No, it's height. No, it's depth. He starts out, he, he says, know that love deep within you. And really know, really know, that God made you and has carefully placed you, has carefully put that love in you. That, that was on purpose. Just as God, when he created the world, that was on purpose. He created you on purpose. He placed love within you on purpose. So acknowledge that deep, potent love the thing you draw from, the thing you return to, the thing that keeps you going in difficult seasons of life. Acknowledge that there is something there that is not from you. There is a gift from God. Do you have it? Do you sense it? Sometimes I sense it deep in my core. Do you have it? If you do, do me a favor. Look around as Paul's saying, notice it in the saints. Look at one other person in the church, someone far along in their faith wall. Acknowledge Every deep, potent feeling of love from God that you have, they have it too. It's just as living, just as bright, just as strong in them as it is in you. Really imagine, I try to picture God's love in you. Maybe it's, again, deep inside you. Maybe it's just in one other person here at this church. Imagine it in just that other person and it's just as rich and just as vibrant in them. And then imagine it somehow and every person here. Really, truly, it does not lose its power as it moves out to being in every person here. It's just as vibrant to everyone. And then imagine, we're, we're one church in, in the middle of so many churches in Fort Smith. You know, we may not have all the particulars down. They might not be as good of a church as us, but they know the love of God too. All throughout Fort Smith gathered today are so many people just in Fort Smith, so many people meditating on this deep, potent love within them. It covers the world. You see that? That's the breadth of Christ's love. That's how far it reaches. So know this too. The church it has existed for about 2,000 years now. The Hebrew people that God first worked out his purposes with in the Old Testament stories, they existed long before that. Let's just look. The church. 2,000. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. 2,000 years is a long time. Y'all remember two years ago? Y'all remember? Imagine that. Remember, we didn't know a thing about face masks two years ago. We didn't. Social distancing was something I have been doing for years, but it's new for a lot of you all. <laughs> But do me, this is going to be painful, this is going to be hard. Imagine two years ago, how long that's felt. Imagine a hundred of that. Or really, no. A thousand of that. My mouth saw it this morning. Imagine a thousand of that. That's how long the church has been doing this, has been bringing people to this aliveness, this discipleship of Jesus. Another, an easier one, you don't have to think of COVID in this one. Imagine it was, uh, it was like 20 years ago. Do you remember the song, Who Let the Dogs Out? <laughs> that was about 20 years ago. It's been a while since I heard that song. And thank the Lord for that. <laughs> but imagine 100 of those. 100 of those. 2,000 years is a, is a vast, long, long time. The generations that have come and gone. You know what's endured? Jesus Christ and His love. His people. That's massive. That is the length of Christ's love. Do you see the breadth that's gone worldwide? The length that's been happening for 2,000 years. Let's keep going. Now imagine God in heaven. 
Or maybe as we start, imagine God like you did as a child, right, sitting on a cloud somewhere. Now we know, of course, he's not on a cloud. We, we grew up, we went to Sunday school and the like. But imagine he's, he's maybe up in space, like one of those pictures we see from NASA where we see, you know, the Earth and it's just sort of all right there. But they've gone up that far, they didn't find God yet. Imagine further out, right, you're seeing the Earth recede as a pale blue dot from the background. Getting past where the Hubble telescope can find. You're getting to the edges of the universe, and it's beyond that. It's way up there. It's way up there. So high up that, you know, the song, he's got the whole wide world in his hands. Really, he's got the whole universe in his hands. Way up there. Think about all of, all of life, everything that's being held, watched over by God. And high. That is the height of God's love. That is where Jesus Christ descended from, from something so unimaginably far from us, yet watching from, over us. He came to us. That is the height of God's love, unimaginably high up there. Lastly, imagine from that point, way up there, way, the place where Jesus Christ left his throne to descend to earth, to live a life of selflessness, to get in the trenches with people, no matter how low in life they were. How low, even to the extent that the people, they could put him on the cross and he continued, he was in there with them, loving on them, doing right by them, forgiving them, showing them mercy. Imagine how low you sink whenever you are dead, gruesomely crucified on the cross, executed by the Romans, the authorities that were supposed to be protecting you. But executed an innocent man. Imagine how low you have to sink. Imagine how low the hearts of the disciples sank as they walked on and saw that. Imagine the terrible things that we've seen throughout all of history that Christ has somehow been present, has been walking with people through. That is the depth of Christ's love. He has walked in the trenches that deep with each of us. But now, take all that together, imagine that deep, low place in life in your own heart. Know that you've been touched with the grace of God. Know that deep place within you, that's not just the darkness, it's, it's more a luminous darkness. It's alive with that same power of the resurrection. That's what grace means, that God has placed His same life-giving power, His same grace, His same salvation, that physically rose Jesus from the dead. He has placed that within you now that deep, low place that you have gone to on your worst day. Know that God is that deep within you, or rather, instead of knowing it, lovingly accept it, like in verse 19. Understand it in a way that, that knowledge can't grasp at. That is Paul's prayer, that we would accept, we would grow in this love that is massive and overwhelming, that has gone all over the world, that is deep within you and deep within each of our neighbors. That has existed for about 2,000 years now, probably longer if we consider the Hebrew people. That continues to, to shine down from us from, from heaven, from somewhere unimaginably far off and greater than us. It continues to reach not, not to just the lofty you know, emperors and leaders, but reaches specifically, on purpose, to the deep, dark places of life, to lift that up. Paul, after outlining his prayer, his, his petition that deep in your souls, you would be brimming with this life, with this power of the resurrection, with his petition that you would root yourself in this life, on this love, and no matter what comes your way, you would always, always return to it. That's what it was designed for. After his petition, that he would understand the massive scope of his love, how wide across the world it spreads, how long it endures, what great heights it came to us from, how deeply set into our own souls God has placed it, deeper than anything in life, by the way. That's one of the greatest things in Christianity is there's still evil, there's still wickedness, but it is superficial. It can cut you up and scar you, it cannot reach where God has placed his love deep within you. After outlining this, what, what Paul's repeatedly been praying over and over again for the Ephesians, 
and in a sense for all Christians, even now for us, he shifts focus. He, he can't help but say, this is the God I believe in. It says in verse 20 and 21, this is the God I can't help but trust in. This is the power that I trust in within the universe. The one who is more powerful than me or you or anyone else. This is a God who is glorious and wonderful. This is a God who doesn't want to push us around like chess pieces, but deeply, powerfully, and subtly guides us through life by bringing new life and aliveness deep within us until we're all the way home. This is the God who we praise in churches all across the world. Now, none of those other churches are as good as us, but, you know, they're doing their best. But we share that same God. This is the God who Jesus completely trusted in and was raised by. This is the God of all generations. This is the God who has, for lack of a better term, taken us prisoner, made us captive, enthralled us and guided us, and still to this day makes us desire deeply to know his ways. So chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he concludes, says, this is the God who has captivated us by his glorious love, whose plan we can't help but deeply, deeply desire to work out. This is the God who is really at work in the world. This isn't just a story. This is really the pow a power beyond what we can understand that works through us. And so, it's simple. Just be gentle, be patient, be humble, bear with one another. We're all recipients of this, this deep gift of grace. Acknowledge that. But there are two notes as we conclude from that. First, we have to acknowledge, given Paul's prayer, his hope, his prayer that we would be spurred on to pray, that we cannot neglect our relationship with God. Now, there is an old story that I love. It's about uh, a monk, an old monk and a young monk. And the old monk is trying to get the young monk to pray more and more. And he says to the young monk, you need to pray every morning, at least 15 minutes. The young monk says, I have a lot to do. I'm really busy. Alright? So the old monk says, okay, if that's the case, if you're really busy, you need to pray every day, every morning, for at least 30 minutes. The first big takeaway from this prayer, it's just like that story. Let God breathe new life into you before you go out and try to change the world. Let God breathe new life into you before you go get in a fight with someone, or go argue, or go try to take some big project on. Don't run on empty. The same way is, the same takeaway is similar. It's something to think on. The truth is that our love is actually three dimensional. You know, this church, we really have a heart for our neighbors, for, for our neighbors near and far, and I love that. That's, that's one of the greatest things. It's one of the deepest honors to be pastor here. But when we see, we see all of these people alongside us, sort of on the horizontal axis, we seek to love them well, and that's, again, just incredible. Because we really, we really mean it when we pray and we say, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We mean that. We show up for that. And given that, you know, we're working on, on bettering it in big structural ways and getting all the details worked out, but what we have to what we have to understand that as we do that, as we hope to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we have to make sure we're able to offer real love, real service, real care for our neighbors. And the way we do that is we grow on the vertical axis. We don't try to overextend ourselves to our neighbors. Instead, we grow closer to the source of that love. You see, as we grow closer to that source, as we tap deeper into our roots, what we're rooted in, the love of God, it naturally will flow from us. We don't try to force, if we were a tree, force fruits to come out harder. Instead, we grow deeper into the source of the love. There is a power. Understand, there is a power. The Greek word for it found in verse 16 is, is dynamis. It's the root word from which we get dynamite. It's what Paul in this context is is using to talk about God's grace deep within our souls. It's the same power that's in the resurrection. In every good thing in nature, the sun coming up each morning, the new flowers blooming every spring. 
the same aliveness in your souls. Paul, he is imprisoned in Rome. He is praying continually, continually, that we would know this power well. Because God is offering something great. And it's free. Pay attention to the vertical axis of love. Run closer to the love of God if you want to love others better. Do not neglect your spiritual life. Do not try to run on empty or be a tree with shallow roots. I pray, grow closer to God through, through study, through Sunday school, through spending time with other church members. You know, really seek to know God more every day. Choose a spiritual practice, like prayer. By the way, we got a, another hand out in the narthex. That one's on Christian prayer. I highly recommend it. But find one of those practices. Stick with it. If you want to pour more love into the world, be sure you're connected, that you were rooted in the source of that.
As we prepare for communion today, I'm struck with the thought that there are two kinds of people in the world. The kind of people that think there's only two kinds of people that think people that don't. And actually, there are many kinds of people. And I think back about how many ways if we look at people and how many ways that divides us and how many ways people will use things to divide us, right? White people, black people, the people whose ancestors come from Europe, from Asia, Africa, the Americas, people whose native language is, is English, people whose native language is something else, straight people, gay people, cisgender, transgender. Another one that divides us a lot these days. Others. There's blue people and red people. Right? Think of all the ways that we divide ourselves into us and them. Right? And throughout it all, there's the people of privilege who are trying desperately to die others that privilege. And suppose we take those people and we take an empty room We throw them in there together. And we lock up the door. And we shake it up a little bit. Maybe pipe in a little bit of Facebook and Twitter in there with them. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Not good. Not good, right? <laughs> but maybe. But maybe perhaps, perhaps, if that room is the church, Okay, and we look in there, in that in the church, right? And we look in the in that in there, and maybe they can come to the table of God, and maybe together through communion and through our experiences in church, we can maybe just get a little bit of that love that Nick was talking about, and maybe we'll find out in the end. That after all, there's really only one kind of people. There's the people of God. Okay. So let's uh, let's pray together, please. God, our Father, we ask your blessings on the faithful of this congregation and on the tithes and offerings freely given in support of your mission for us here, at First Christian Church. We ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us in the proper stewardship of these resources. We know that we are but caretakers of all that you have provided us. As we were reminded recently on Earth Day, we understand that you have provided the most wonderful planet for us, and that we have the responsibility to care for it and each of us. Please help us to adequately do our part to shoulder these responsibilities. Your gifts to us abound. We cherish your great gift of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Help us to better understand his teaching and help us to truly follow him. Each worship service we commemorate his Last Supper with his disciples through this sacramental meal. Let us all now prepare ourselves for this communion with you. Forgive us of our sins, create in us a clean heart, and set right our relationships with you and our neighbors. Strengthen us with your spirit. Help us to tear down barriers among us and to truly be one family with you as our Father. And instill in us that abounding love that makes us all one. Amen. The table of the Lord is set. We are all one family. All are welcome.
Lord Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, took a loaf of bread, blessed it, and broke it, said, This is my body, which is given to you. Take of it, all of you, eat of it, and do so in remembrance of me. In a similar way, he took the cup after supper. He looked at God, he thanked God for it, and he said, This cup is a new covenant, a new humanity, sealed in my blood. Forgiveness of sin of many people. Take it all to drink it. Do so in remembrance of me. Sunday school, we're going to be going through the entire story of the Bible in about 20 minutes. <laughs> it's not going to be, I can go through the entire story of the Bible, going through Ephesians in 20 minutes. Y'all have seen how that's going. <laughs> but with that, let's stand for our invitation to discipleship. Let us draw closer to God, the giver of life and love and all good things. May our opening ourselves to God open us to love all our neighbors, especially those most vulnerable, from now until God brings us home. Receive now this benediction. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.